I think again that my being gay made me also bond with science. It's nonsense. If it exists, it's in line with the laws of nature. Absolutely. When the police is using this kind of technology to identify gay teenagers even before they know it about themselves. They already apply these technologies to some regions with Muslim uh, population. Environment, democracy, tolerance, you can't fight all the battles by yourself. If I'm a straight man and I discover that my neighbor is gay, I should be extremely happy. Right. Homophobia was first brought by the Western imperialists and whose descendants are now complaining that all these cultures are so homophobic and this is extremely frightening for authoritarian regimes who don't want their citizens to think openly and creatively about the order of society. Yeah. Part of me was 100% attracted to other guys. And then another part of me knew absolutely nothing about it. Wow. Oof. <laughs> That's a difficult question to, to, to start with, uh, so I, I need to think about it for a moment. Did you ever feel as a white crow uh, in academic circles? So the last week, it was the International Day Against Homophobia, and the Global Pride is coming soon. So today I decided to focus more primarily on the LGBT topics. And mm -hmm. I noticed that you are rarely talking about it publicly. You are mostly invited to talk about technologies and artificial intelligence and stuff like that, but not LGBT. And I'm really curious about your ideas as a historian and philosopher. I remember in the introduction of your recent book, you mentioned that uh, Homo sapiens is most of focus on past, homo deus on um, future, and mm -hmm. um, like 21 lesson uh, is about the current times and the challenges of 21st century. And I want to talk with you correspondently about LGBT um, community mm -hmm. in the past, in the future, and the challenges of this time right now. The history of 20th century, it teaches us uh, that LGBT rights um, safety and visibility uh, of LGBT people is a kind of privilege um, we meet almost exclusively in the liberal democracies. So mm -hmm. why do you think it is so, uh, especially in the 20th and 21st century? Uh, oof. <laughs> That's a difficult question to, to, to start with. Uh, so I, I need to think about it f for a moment. But First of all, I, I'm not sure it's true, because it's not like all traditional societies prior to the modern liberal democracies of the Western world have been homophobic or have been homophobic to, to the same degree. Yeah. You find great differences. Um, you know, you go to the Philippines, and there traditionally there is far greater acceptance of at least um, some parts of the sexual spectrum and gender spectrum far greater acceptance than in the US until a very short time ago. Uh, if you look at the Abrahamic religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam has been quite homophobic, or, or at least I mean, in, in principle, have been extremely homophobic uh, for the last 2,000 years. But other religions have not been like that. You look at Hinduism, you look at Buddhism, you look at uh, various polytheistic, polytheistic religions in the ancient world, they were far more accepting. Uh, even within the monotheistic Abrahamic religions, you find different norms and habits in different periods. For instance, in many Muslim countries, there was far greater tolerance of homosexual behavior in the Middle Ages than in Muslim countries today or in Christian countries in the Middle Ages. So I, I would definitely not begin an, you know, an, an, an interview about LGBT history and LGBT rights with the assumption that it's only in the modern West 
that uh, there is tolerance and recognition. And in all other cultures and settings, it, it doesn't exist and we, we need to explain it. In a way, we need to explain the rise of homophobia, not the rise of LGBT rights, uh, because homophobia, you know, it's not universal. It's certainly not natural. You know, there is a lot of discussions often about whether homosexuality is natural. And we can talk about that. But one thing which is certain is that homophobia is an extremely strange phenomenon from a biological and evolutionary perspective, especially homophobia among men. If I'm a straight man and I discover that my neighbor is gay, I should be extremely happy. In evolutionary terms, this is the best thing that can ever happen to me because it means there is less competition for yeah. the available mates, for the available women. Yeah. If anybody should you know, be upset, maybe it's the, it's the women, but certainly not the men. So how to explain widespread homophobia among men? This is something very strange. I wouldn't begin then our discussion with the assumption that say, homophobia is natural and we need to explain the rise of LGBT rights in, in the modern West as some kind of unexpected or unique phenomenon. Absolutely. And interestingly, uh, you know that some historians admit that sexual liberty and um, homosexual uh, relationship, um, even in public places, were uh, very typical for Russia before 18th century. Uh, and we can find like many notes and diaries of European travelers who were shocked and diplomats who came here and who were shocked by like this uh, sexual liberty here. And um, the first homophobic laws uh, had been adopted by Peter the Great, like in the beginning of the 18th century. Yeah. Uh, and it was... Uh, it's actually qu quite common in many parts of the world yeah, that you have this kind of CISO that first the European imperialists come, they find a tolerant society, and then they accuse it of yeah. being uh, licentious and sinful because it's tolerant, for instance, towards gays, and then they convince or, or, or force the local population to adopt a much more intolerant and homophobic attitude, saying this is moral. And then 200 years later, they come and they say, hey, you're homophobic. Uh, that's not right. And then they, they try to convince them to, to be far more. So, you know, in, in many cases, we see it in Japan, you, we see it in Africa, that the homophobia was first brought by the Western imperialists and whose descendants are now complaining that all these cultures are so homophobic and we, the Westerners, we are so tolerant and advanced. Yeah, and this is kind of historical irony to me. Yeah. Uh, so I wonder, back to my first, uh, very first question, I didn't mean that LGBT rights is an achievement, unique achievement of modern Western liberal democracy, but I rather uh, meant that previously in traditional, very authoritarian regimes, it was totally okay to be gay. Yeah. But, it, but today, uh, any authoritarian or not liberal uh, country, mm -hmm barely can stand uh, LGBT people and they always suffer lack of rights and so on. So why uh, the authoritarian regimes mm. of the past were more tolerant to LGBT people than today? Why it, this uh, topic is so sensitive for modern, uh, yeah. like Islamic or Russian or other countries like even Poland, mm -hmm. for instance? Well, first of all, as you say, it's important, again, to emphasize that ancient authoritarian regimes were not necessarily homophobic. If you look at, say, the first totalitarian society in history was ancient Sparta, and it was at the same time totalitarian, extremely militaristic, and extremely gay-friendly, at least in the sense of not only allowing but celebrating uh, sexual relations and romantic relations between men. And, you know, uh, several of the emperors of the Roman Empire uh, were uh, in engaged in homosexual relations. So, yes, it's not that there is a law of nature that if you are a dictator or if you are an emperor, you have to be homophobic. Why is it today? 
Um, again, it's, it's mainly in Christian and Muslim societies. Uh, China, for instance, is much more tolerant, at least today, of LGBT rights uh, than, uh, as far as I know, Russia or in the Muslim world. Mm -hmm. um, so again, we, we, we should understand that this is largely a um, Judeo-Christian Muslim phenomenon. And here it's just, you know, the thing of, it's not just that authoritarian regimes um, tend to rely on sanctifying traditions and taking these traditions to extreme. It's also more that in, in the setting of the um, Christian and Muslim world, being gay or being lesbian or being transgender makes you think, makes you question things. Yeah. And the last thing that authoritarian regimes like is people thinking for themselves and, and sure. people questioning the basic rules of society. You know, growing up in, for instance, in, in my case, growing up in a Jewish country, so uh, in a Jewish tradition, being gay forced me to think and question about many of the rules and traditions. You find your deepest uh, desires, your deepest emotions being running co counter to the, some of the most basic stories of society. Yes. And you're forced to confront that. And in many cases, li like in my case, you reach the conclusion that society is mistaken, not my emotions. Uh, people come and tell you that there is a great God above the clouds that tells us how to live, and he doesn't like two men to love each other. This is a sin. But you examine yourself and you see that there, there is nothing wrong with it. Even if there is a great God above the clouds, it's ridiculous to think that he would punish people for love. Yeah. You know, I can understand a great God punishing people for violence, punishing people for hatred, for cruelty. Yes, that makes sense. But why would a good God punish two people just for loving each other? How old were you when you came to this idea? It evolved gradually over my teenage years, and uh, I finally came out when I was, I was 21, but it kind of developed for, for, for several years. And, you know, questioning in, in, in this way the basic stories of society, the basic stories of tradition, is something which, for an authoritarian regime, is extremely dangerous. Because if somebody, based on, on this experience, realizes that one story is just a human invention. It's not really God. It's some people invented that story to serve their own purposes. Then you start thinking, hey, maybe other fundamental stories of society are just like that. They are not a law of nature. They did not come down from heaven. It's just some humans invented this story. And this is extremely frightening for authoritarian regimes Right. who don't want their citizens to think openly and creatively about the order of society, why things are the way they are. So they immediately identify uh, LGBT people as potential disruptors of the social order and potential uh, seeds of new thinking. Of course, it's not like I, that in all societies, but in, in, in Christian and Muslim societies, this is definitely the case. Yes, and they are totally right because, as we know from like 1960s, the liberation comes all together. And if you start to liberate LGBT, you inevitably um, end with like all the national minorities, black people, like women's rights, and everything. No, not, not inevitably. Again, I mean, it, we, there is nothing inevitable in, in history. I don't know. I see the development of the LGBT movement in Israel. And what you see here is something quite different, that as at least part of the, the more mainstream part of the LGBT community is becoming far more accepted by society, then uh, in many cases, they simply adopt 
the dominant stories of society and they stop being a disruptive force. They focus their effort on, you know, normalizing. Like, we want to get married, we want to have children, we want to serve in the army, we want to be exactly like everybody else. And we have to be even more patriotic and even more militaristic than straight people just to prove that there is nothing different about us. And, you know, you look at maybe the most prominent gay politician today in Israel, uh, who was formerly the justice minister and he's now just been appointed uh, the minister of internal security, very powerful job in charge of the police and, and so forth. And he's openly gay, but he's also openly militaristic and nationalistic and racist. Uh, he will not do anything to help, say, Palestinian minor- minorities in Israel. Um, so, you know, in, in kind of mythological terms, you first fight the monster, you defeat the monster, then you become the monster. Yes. That's what happens often to heroes in history. And that also happens to uh, heroes in mythology. And that also tends to happen to historical movements. So just because gays have been, um, you know, discriminated against and oppressed for many years, once they gain power, some kind of power, there is no guarantee that they will be any better right. than their previous oppressors. Actually, it is a very interesting point. I never thought about it this way. Because, um, yeah, I think I have uh, kind of romantic ideas of uh, liberation movement uh, that mm. come like 20 second part of the Yeah, but even if you forget about LGBT, you look at national liberation movements and you find these figures, I don't know, like Mugabe in Zimbabwe. Or again, after, like after a great um, a revolution of 1917. Yeah. It was, I mean, it didn't take long for the oppressed to become the oppressors very quickly. <laughs> that's true. Um, it also, um, you mentioned before uh, the idea of natural homophobia or tolerance. It reminds me um, the topic about uh, this uh, discussion about being born this way as a gay person versus conscious, deliberate choice of the lifestyle. And I'm yeah. sure you are aware of the work of Shamus Han, the sociologist from Columbia University. Um, who was arguing that uh, while desire might be biologically driven, it moves on tracks of um, like human culture. And Mm -hmm. uh, interestingly, in times of liberation again in the 60s, African-American activists aggressively called out arguments about genetic and biological differences as like legacy of racism and Nazi science. And by contrast, the uh, marriage equality movement now uh, embracing the biological determinism, saying like, we were born this way and so we have all the same rights just based on this biological determinism. So I wonder, what do you think about it and which side in this conversation uh, do you lean to? I'm not an expert in that. As far as I know, um, it's a mixture. Of course, like, like almost in all cases, it's a mixture of biology and culture. It's not like even those who... Um, and I think there is some genetic basis for Definitely. homosexuality or for, or for transgender. Um, like there is a genetic, genetic basis for almost everything, but it's just a basis. Yes. It's not like there is one gene that immediately determines uh, your, your character or your sexual identity, or your gender identity. And especially your lifestyle, right? Yeah, it, it, it's, it's... So I think we don't need to get too much caught up in this discussion of whether it's biology or whether it's culture. Almost everything humans do is a mixture of biology and culture. You think about playing football. So there is a genetic and biological basis for playing football. If you don't have legs, you can't play football. That, that's very obvious. But then just because you have legs and you can play football doesn't mean that you do it or that you like it. 
uh, you need an entire culture to be created around it, to invent the rules of the game, what to do with it. And it's the same with uh, the game of romance and the game of sex. Uh, different cultures in history have created so many different games around sexuality and around family and around romance. There is not any one way which you can say this is the natural, even leaving aside LGBT people, also for straight people. What does it mean to be straight? Uh, does it mean that you have just one partner from the opposite gender for your, for, for your entire life? Not necessarily. I mean, throughout history, we have seen so many different models for straight romance and for straight relationships. Yes. Whether it's a sultan with a harem of a hundred concubines, or whether it's, you know, Catholic marriage for your entire life, or whether it's serial monogamy, like you just have one partner at any one time, but you keep changing them. You get divorced and you get married again or, or whatever. The relations between whether the relations are equal in many societies in history, in many cultures in history, uh, women were considered the property of men. Yes. At first, they were the property of their father or, or brother. And when they got married, they became the property of their husbands. Now, it's not biology. It's culture that yeah. determines all these things. Yes. So it's the same with LGBT people. Uh, yes, their biology is involved, but how does your life look, even how your sexual or romantic life look as a gay man, that is not determined by the genes. That is mostly the work of culture. Yes. And that's interesting because uh, now, maybe for the first time in the whole uh, history of the world, we realize all this historical uh, background and we know that uh, something that is um, determined by the religion or tradition is not the only truth and we can enjoy any sort of relationship, uh, like as you mentioned. Uh, not just monogamous or um, serial monogamy, but also anything else. So I wonder, the world um, itself be becomes uh, here very complicated because previously it was so simple. You knew from um, your society what is uh, proper and what is not proper, what is good and bad, and how you should behave. Now it's like... Uh, like whole range of options and uh, that like frightens a lot of people and mm -hmm. uh, how do you think it's going to evolve in the future uh, considering mm -hmm. the fact of like overpopulation and uh, on one hand we lost the strict culture of what is good and bad and like strict religion rules and so on i don't think we lost it i mean i think we have a better understanding of it for many cultures in history, good and bad meant you get some laws from heaven which tell you what is good and what is bad, and following these rules is good, and disobeying them is bad. And, and, and this, I, I think, was a very poor understanding of morality and of good and bad. It, dependent, it depended on a belief, on some supernatural power defining for us what is good and bad, assuming that people can't know it for themselves. Yes. I think now in many modern societies, we have a much clearer understanding of morality. Morality is not about rules coming down from heaven. Morality is about suffering. It's very, very simple. Morality is about suffering. To cause unnecessary suffering to another sentient being, this is bad. To help protect people and also other animals from suffering, this is good. You don't kill somebody, not because some god said so. You don't kill somebody because it harms this person. It causes not only this person, but their family, their friends, their neighbors to be miserable. You don't steal, not because somebody said 2,000 years ago, don't steal. 
You don't steal because this is causing suffering to somebody. It's so simple. And it's the same with sexual morality. Rape is bad. And today we understand it better than any previous religion in history, I think. You know, in the Bible, there is no um, clear saying that rape is bad. Because a woman was considered the property of a man, and in many cases, he can do what he, what he wants with her. In, in the Bible, if a man rapes a woman, he's actually committing a crime against the owner of the property, the woman, her father. If she's married, that's a different... But if, she's, if a man... In the Bible, if a man rapes an unmarried woman, this is a property crime against the owner of the property, which is now damaged. And the way to uh, uh, solve the problem is to pay money or goats or whatever to the owner, to the father or brother, and then the woman is yours. No longer, it's not rape. We today have a much, much better concept of why rape is, it's not a property crime. It causes immense suffering to the woman. That's the problem. So don't do it. It's very simple. And it also, of course, reflects on the whole issue of LGBTs. If two men love each other and they have sex or they are in a long-term relationship, there is no suffering. It doesn't harm anyone. And something which doesn't harm anybody is not a sin. It's not bad. It's not evil. It's not a crime. It shouldn't be forbidden. Well, so I think um, we, today we have, we have a much clearer view of morality. I don't think we are in some kind of a moral chaos or moral panic. You see that in many cases, the most liberal societies in the world are also the most peaceful, the most law-abiding. Uh, you compare Syria to the Netherlands, and, you know, in the Netherlands, religion is not part of the state. Many people are atheists. They don't believe in some rules that came down from heaven. But if you check uh, the levels of crime and violence, uh, it's much better in the Netherlands. And I hope that this trend will continue. That, yes, it's good that people have more options. It can be confusing sometimes when you have a lot of options and it's not all dictated. But if you have a clear moral compass and you just remind yourself, morality is about preventing suffering. It's very simple. That well, even well, when that, you uh, have a lot of choices, I don't, there is no need to fear some kind of moral chaos or society collapsing. Well, uh, I, I mean, uh, the ethics itself, it's not that simple because um, what, who do you um, uh, bring harm or not? And how many, uh, what can you sacrifice for not doing harm uh, and so on? It's true. It's, it's, com it, it sometimes is complicated what happens when you do something that makes you feel good and makes somebody else feel bad. Then you have a conflict. But the way to, uh, and there are, of course, moral conflicts in our world, but the way you resolve the conflict is not by appealing to some supernatural law. It's you examine what kind of harm I'm causing the other person, what kind of benefit do I get, and how do they compare to one another. The yes. rapist who rapes a woman, yes, he enjoys it, but she suffered tremendously. And when you compare the two, it's obvious. Actually, when you look even deeper, you realize the rapist is even harming himself. He thinks he's enjoying it, but he's actually uh, destroying his own peace of mind. He is acquiring, he will not be able to have any deep, loving relationships in his life. If you get into the habit of doing terrible things to other people, you can only do it by desensitizing yourself to what they feel, and yes. then you won't have a, a good relationship with, with anybody. Now, there are more complicated yeah, situations. I, I, I see your point, and it's a very simple example, but um, as we know from your books, uh, there are much more complicated uh, issues we're facing yeah. now, like economy versus ecology. 
And that's this true. Is an ethical uh, question, which has uh, not such an easy answer what should we sacrifice and what is good here there should we like uh sacrifice uh, some economy for uh, ecological reasons or not or like yeah i mean th- there are complicated discussions of course uh but then also you need you, you need to have a debate about it and the debate should be conducted in terms of feelings and suffering and happiness, not in terms of some supernatural commandments. Absolutely. Uh, when you have the economy versus the ecology, then you need to take into account, okay, if I uh, cut greenhouse gas emissions by uh, banning fossil fuels, that may increase the cost of energy, so poor people will not be able to heat their houses, and they will suffer from that. If, on the other hand, I do nothing, and in 20 years or 30 years there is a global catastrophe, ecological catastrophe, then people will suffer from that. So, yeah, it's complicated. We need to have this debate, but the debate is in terms of suffering, not in terms of somebody coming and saying, I had a revelation from some god, and he said, forget about the climate just burn as much fuel as you want. When you die, you'll go to heaven, and then there is no climate change in heaven, it will be okay. That's not the way to decide the argument. Uh, yeah, of course not. And I'm not, uh, I don't believe, uh, actually, that there will be some prophet who will be taken seriously if he come and say things <laughs> like that. But on the other hand, uh, what people uh, trust more, like uh, laws of economy, Uh, or laws of nature and like environmental evolution. This is tricky because uh, I'm pretty sure that most of people who are in power here in, in Russia or in the US, they more believe in economy than in ecology because they don't take serious all those challenges uh, we're talking about. I want to talk also about uh, xenophobia. Uh, it's one of your like important topics. And now we are in the midst of this coronavirus pandemics, and it turns out that xenophobia is like soaring uh, in many countries. And I remember mm-hmm. once, like two months ago, one of my um, random acquaintance uh, said, told to me, "You see." It's like Chinese. It's fucking Chinese. All the problems are from them. And that, that was silly and stupid, but I noticed that it's like very natural feeling um, of xenophobia uh, um, as a reaction to the threat of uh, coronavirus. And exactly the same is back uh, there on the other side in China when uh, people yeah. um, are frightened uh, and start to uh, well, uh, feel xenophobia towards Europeans. So... Uh, Apparently, coronavirus is one of the first and definitely, definitely not the last uh, global crisis uh, of the um, 21st century. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I wonder, what do you think? Because uh, LGBT people uh, previously in the 20th century were most vulnerable uh, to xenophobia. Like, yeah. first people to suffer from it when something goes wrong. Like, I don't know first or second uh, world wars, and so on, Nazis. Um, so do you think that in times of like overpopulation, economical and ecological crises, uh, LGBT people should be uh, alarmed and should be, is there anything we should be afraid of? Well, first as people, before we, we were LGBT people, we were people, and as, as people, we should be alarmed by the rise of hatred and xenophobia and disunity in the world, uh, both because hatred is a terrible thing and causes people to do terrible things to others, and also because our major problems in the 21st century are all global, not just the coronavirus epidemic, but also climate change, also the rise of disruptive technologies like artificial intelligence. Um, To deal with them, we need global cooperation. There is no other way. And the more disunity and xenophobia there is in the world, the less able we are 
to deal with these uh, threats, which threaten the, the whole of, of, of humanity. And yes, LGBT people historically tend to suffer even more because they are often singled out. Well, when you have a r- rising wave of xenophobia and extreme nationalism, they are often singled out as s- people who are outside the community, as traitors. You know, during the Cold War, the Americans thought that uh, gay people were communist agents, whereas in the Soviet Union, people said gay people, they are capitalist inf- infiltrators. You couldn't... You you are always belonging to to the other side, right? And that's that's a, a danger again. I think what the most important thing to say is that um, there is no problem with patriotism and nationalism, whether you are gay or straight. It doesn't matter. Um, it's good to love your country and to serve it, but to you need to understand nationalism in the right way. Nationalism is not xenophobia. Nationalism is not about hating foreigners. Nationalism is about loving your compatriots. For instance, a good nationalist is not somebody who goes around saying, all the foreigners are bad, we need to expel them, we need to fight them. That's not a good nationalist. You know who is a good nationalist? Somebody who pays his taxes honestly, without corruption, without bribery, in order that other people in the country will have good education and healthcare. If you're a big billionaire in Moscow, you prove that you're a patriot by paying your taxes so that people in Vladivostok will get good healthcare. That's patriotism. It has nothing to do with how much you hate foreigners or you hate gays. Similarly, if you're, I don't know, a government minister and you want to prove you're a great patriot, then don't say nasty things about foreigners. Rather, to prove your patriotism, when you appoint somebody to an important position in in the civil service, don't pick your cousin or your friend. Pick the most competent person. That's patriotism. Yeah, because that might be so, and, the meaning of patriotism. But uh, if we look to modern Russia or Poland and any other uh, Eastern European countries, the nation, in fact, nationalism there is perceived as this like superior feeling of superiority, and, and that's a big mistake. I mean, it's not it's not just in Russia or in Poland or in Hungary. We see it in many other places around the world today and in the past that people just don't understand what nationalism means. And so we need to remind them that it's not about hating foreigners, it's about loving your compatriots. And if you remember that, then there is no problem. Uh, As you say, unfortunately, many, many times, people misunderstand it or forget it. And then there is a lot of problem, but when you deal with it, you shouldn't run to the opposite extreme of saying nationalism is bad because then you're just playing into their hands. Then you just make it easier for them to brand you as a traitor. He doesn't like the country. He's against us. No, Uh, I think especially for LGBT people, it's important not to fall into the trap. You say, no, I'm a great patriot, but patriotism doesn't mean hating anybody. Mm-hmm. And it means loving people, loving my other uh, people in, in, in my country. And I serve my country by being a good teacher or a good doctor uh, or paying my taxes honestly. And right. that's much more patriotic than making hate speeches and spreading seeds of hatred and violence all around. Who wants to live in a place full of you know, the burning fire of hatred and violence? You're making the country worse, not better. I wish we we could get back to this uh, genuine uh, meaning of the patriotism because now it's at least here in Russia and I'm sure in Israel as well. Uh, sometimes mm-hmm. it's um, like um, over uh, used. So anyway, you are uh, one of the most famous anthropologists and philosophers of our days. 
and you're an openly gay person, which is rare among the academic circles. So I, you mentioned that you uh, came out when you were 21. Mm -hmm. uh, my question is, how did it um, uh, went through? Uh, mm -hmm. Was it easy for you to come out to your family, to your colleagues uh, and friends? Is it, was it okay in Israel back in that time? Uh, the most difficult thing was with myself. I mean, for several years, and, and it taught me a lot about the mysteries of the human mind, because for quite a number of years, it was a kind of dual consciousness, which I can't really explain, when part of me knew exactly what, what's happening. Part of me was 100% attracted to, to other guys. And then another part of me knew absolutely nothing about it. When I was 15, 16, these two parts coexisted somehow. I can't really explain it. You know, I, I think I'm quite an intelligent person, but somehow I managed not to understand the simplest thing about myself, and I don't know how. I just know it's a fact. I could at one moment fantasize about a guy, and the next moment I would be completely certain that I'm, it would have even crossed my mind to ask myself whether I'm straight or not. It was obvious that I was. And this was kind of the main struggle for several years. I guess, you know, I, I grew up in the 1980s, early 1990s in Israel, which was uh, quite a homophobic society. I mean, it's, you hardly heard anything about gay people. It's, yeah. um, and you did, never saw them on television. You didn't, I mean, there were a few glimpses. And as, as I, even as a kid, I liked to read history. So I, I know that I read stories, for example, about Alexander the Great having a lover. And this kind of suddenly made me very in, interested. Or I read about, also in ancient Greece, that Athenian democracy was established by two gay lovers who murdered the last dictator, the last tyrant of Athens. And I knew that somehow these stories, I find it incredibly relevant or appealing to me, but I didn't quite figure out why. And it was a number of years like that of kind of an internal, un unrecognized struggle. Um, Finally, when I was 21, it kind of, the, the wall inside my mind came down. Um, and, it, and then it, suddenly everything made sense. And it was so obvious. And once I realized it about myself, I, I came to, to, tell, to term it within myself, I almost immediately told uh, the other important people in my life, like my friends and my parents and my sisters. Um, and did, you, uh, did it ever affect your career? Mm, no, I mean, Israeli Academy, at least, you know, I, I, I was a student in the 1990s. I came out, it was 97, I was doing my MA degree, my postgraduate studies, and later I went to Oxford to do my PhD. And I was completely open, and there was no issue about that. And afterwards, when I came back, so in, in I know that in other countries, even today, it's not like that. But uh, one good thing about Israel, Israel, Israeli Academy in the last 20 years is that it, it was no, no problem. I didn't fear that because of that, they will not give me a job or, or, or something like that. So... Right. You know, I, I came a little after the time it was dangerous. I benefited from the sacrifices and the, the courage of the previous generation. The people who came out in the 1980s, early 1990s, they took huge risks. And I came after that and I could really kind of uh, uh, get the fruits of, of their bravery, of their actions. In general, do you consider yourself more as an academic scientist or as a popularizer of the science? I, I try to do both. 
I don't think you can popularize science without having uh, a, a good understanding of science. Uh, most of what I do is really kind of build the bridge right. between the world of science and the general public. But to build this bridge, you need uh, good foundations on, on both sides. You need to understand the science, of course. Also, you need how to communicate with the general public. That, um, you know, the, the way that most scientists write, they can't hold an audience. And so you need people who serve as, as this kind of bridge. Right. Did you ever feel as a white crow uh, in academic circles? Um, certainly not because I'm gay. That's, that's, uh, as far as I know, it was, it was never an issue. Uh, somebody who writes popular science books, yes, that's more of an issue. Most scientists don't do that. Um, many people appreciate it because they understand the importance of popularizing scientists, scientific ideas, especially in our world today, you know, with all the fake news and all the anti-science propaganda. It's very important that people take it on themselves to convey to the public uh, the latest scientific findings and theories. And most scientists, they don't want to do it. They want to be in the laboratory or the archive or do their research. Yes. So they don't see me as a kind of competitor or enemy because I'm not competing with them. I'm taking the, their, the fruits, again, the fruits of their hard labor. You can write a research after five years of research in archives and interviewing people and you write an article or a book and then I read this and, and this book is maybe read by just a hundred people and then I read this and I put some of the conclusions into a popular science book which is read by a million people and that makes the scientist who made the, the, the research she's also happy that, oh, okay, so now my findings are reaching this wide audience, and that's good. Uh, so you never felt alien to the academics, did you? <laughs> no, I, I feel at home in, 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 the, in the academy. Again, I, I think, again, that my being gay made me also bond with science because I often find that science is my greatest friend. Right. That there is... You know, the, the, this basic experience that, that I had, that people come to you and they tell you a story about the world, yes. that there is a great God above the clouds who hates gay people, or that the laws of nature are against two men loving each other. And at first you believe them, but then science comes to your help and tells you, it, don't listen to the stories that people tell you. Examine the reality for yourself. And if the reality, if your direct observation contradicts the stories that the people around you tell you, you go with the observation, you go with the experience. It's much stronger than the stories people tell. So if people tell you Boys love boys, so, sorry, boys love girls, and it's against nature that a boy would love a boy, and you're, I don't know, 14 years old, and you feel that you're actually attracted to other boys, that experience is far more truthful than any story anybody tells you, and that's science. And um, similarly, if people tell you that uh, it's against the laws of nature, it's not about God, it's against the laws of nature for two men to love each other or to live together, then you go to the scientists who are the experts in the laws of nature and they tell you, don't listen to that. Nothing that exists can break the laws of nature. If something actually exists, it means it is in line with the laws of nature. The laws of nature are not like the laws of a country that somebody can break them and get punishment. Like, you can't drive, the state says you can't drive more than 100 kilometers per hour in your car, and you drive 120 kilometers, and a policeman captures you and gives you a fine. 
That's the laws of the country. You can break them and get a fine. It's not like that with nature. With nature, if, if there is a law of nature, then nothing can break. If you, nature says you can't move faster than the speed of light, then you can't go twice the speed of light and just get a ticket <laughs> from some galactic police officer. No, you can't. And if somebody manages to fly a spaceship faster than the speed of light, it just means that we didn't understand the laws of nature correctly previously. Whatever yeah. exists is by definition natural. So if two men love each other, it means this is natural. You can still argue, is it moral or not moral? But the whole argument about breaking the laws of nature, science tells us, forget about it. It's nonsense. If it exists, it's in line with the laws of nature. Speaking about laws of nature, uh, it reminded me the idea from your books uh, that you, uh, uh, it was in Homo Deus, I guess, uh, you uh, mentioned that technologies will uh, allow us to go deeply to the um, work of our brain mm -hmm. and uh, we'll change it somehow, advance yeah. or uh, manipulate anyway. Uh, but on the other hand, um, as far as I know, um, there is a whole um, bunch of um, neurobiologists like Robert Burton and many others who challenge the idea that we uh, even can reach the understanding of how, war, uh, how the brain works, not mm -hmm. to mention the manipulation of the, this work because it's incredibly complicated. And all the brain, big brain projects uh, um, didn't um, come to any physical, real uh, achievements, uh, any close to them. So um, the question is, uh, do you think it's a challenge of uh, the um, like 21st century uh, of some um, nearest future, or it's more about like some two or three um, centuries ahead? Mm -hmm. Well, I think that we are, of course, not there yet. We don't understand the brain deeply, but we understand it much, much better than a century ago. The advance we had in the last century in deciphering the secrets of the human body and especially the brain is immense. So I'm not saying that tomorrow or two years from now, we'll figure it out completely. No, but in the coming decades, we are going to make even more amazing uh, progress, especially with not only the accumulation of biological data, but when we have more and more powerful computers and artificial intelligence to analyze all this data, it's beyond the capacity of the human brain to understand itself, but once you have AI helping you, it's a different story altogether. And I think we will never reach the point when we understand things perfectly and can manipulate things perfectly. But perfection is irrelevant. The really important, nothing is perfect ever. No system is perfect. The really important watershed in the history of the 20th century, 21st century, in the history of humanity, is not when there is a system that understands our brain and ourselves perfectly. It's when there is a system that understands us better than we understand ourselves. And once you reach that point, you can have a level of control and manipulation, which was unimaginable in previous time. You don't need perfection. You just need to be better than the average person, which is not very difficult because the average person or even the, all people, don't understand themselves very well. And I just gave the example previously of that for years, as a teenager, I didn't realize that I was gay. Now, today you have systems that just by collecting and analyzing data about you could know that you're gay before you know it. Uh, you know, we just, uh, people watching their computers, their smartphones, you can just have some AI, some algorithm analyzing the 
not only the content that they watch. Okay, you watch gay porn, you're gay. Wow. No. You even watch straight porn and the computer sees what is happening to your eyes. Where do they focus? Maybe you watch straight porn with your friends because this is what guys do when they are, I don't know, 14. But while most of your friends focus their attention on the girl, your eyes are going to the guy. Maybe you don't even admit it to yourself. None of your friends know it, but the computer could know it. Just by analyzing what is happening to your eyes, where do they go? This is not science fiction. The technology yeah. is, 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 is in, in existence today. Now think about a homophobic society like Russia, or even worse, a place like Iran, where homosexuality is punishable by death, when the police is using this kind of technology to identify gay teenagers even before they know it about themselves. This is not science fiction. This is not the 22nd century. This is today. So this, I would say, is the danger that we face. Systems that understand us better than we understand ourselves, systems that know more about us than we know about ourselves by collecting data about us and analyzing it. Uh, and then they can manipulate us in very, very dangerous ways or manipulate the whole society. Well, uh, this is interesting what exactly you mean by the system because the artificial intelligence itself uh, that uh, collects all the data and even analyzes it, it doesn't... Um, understand it in the way that a uh, mm -hmm. human brain can understand it. It's like a totally different thing. And this is something that it lacks. And uh, most of the scientists are uh, pretty sure that it will never grow to the uh, capacity of thinking. As I agree. I, I don't want to imply that the computer has consciousness or feelings of its own. No, we won't get there anytime soon, if ever. But it's not important. Um, the important thing is that this computer now knows about you. All kinds of things that maybe your mother and father and friends and you yourself don't know about yourself. And this can be used for good or bad. Right. You know, in some places, this can be used to offer counseling to, to, to somebody who is struggling with, with, with uh, uh, unresolved psychological issues. In another place, it could be used to persecute people. In a third place, it can be used to sell you products. You know, there are cases that computer algorithms identified that a woman was pregnant just by analyzing uh, uh, patterns in her behavior before she knew she was pregnant. And the aim was to sell her products, like, I don't know, baby stuff or, or, or whatever. Yes. So... The computer itself, of course, has no internal morality. It doesn't judge what it discovers. This is still in the hands of the humans. But we know from the 20th century how dangerous it is to establish such totalitarian regimes. You know, in Stalin's days in the USSR, in the Soviet Union, it was impossible for the regime to really monitor all the citizens, and know everything about them, it was just too difficult. I mean, you have 200 million Soviet citizens. You can't put a KGB officer, agent, to follow each one of them 24 hours a day. And even if you could, you would get a mountain of paper reports. Like every day, there is a report about every person in the USSR. Now, somebody needs to read these reports, analyze them, reach conclusions. It's... It's impossible. But right. today, you don't need human agents. You have sensors and cameras and microphones everywhere. One problem solved. Secondly, it, the result is not paper reports being accumulated in the KGB headquarters for other people to read. The result is digital data that can be analyzed by AI. So and instead of human agents and human analysts, communicating with peripheral reports, you have sensors and AI communicating in digital information. Right. And that makes it possible for the first time in history to build a total surveillance regime, a regime in which uh, the system monitors everybody all the time. 
And this is a potential for something far, far worse than Stalin's USSR. Uh, and this is not science fiction. It doesn't depend on perfection. It can be done with the technology of today within a few years. And I think this is one of the greatest challenges that people all over the world face. N nobody is safe. The danger is in the United States just as much as in Russia or in Iran. Yes, or in China, where we know that... Or in China, we yeah. ...already apply these technologies to some regions with Muslim uh, population uh, in some parts of China. So since we uh, already live in the world like that, and since uh, we already have these technologies and they develop tremendously and very fast, what is your suggestion? What should we do uh, considering the fact that uh, it's all here and it's going to mm -hmm. be only more and more sophisticated? Well, first of all, we need to realize that the technology is not inevitable. It's not that once you have the technology, there is just one outcome. No, in the 20th century, people used the same industrial technology of trains, electricity, radio, to build totalitarian regimes like the Soviet Union, or, but also liberal democracies like the United States or France or Sweden. Sweden had the same technology like the USSR. It's not that the Swedish people had some amazing technology that enabled them to build a liberal democracy, And the Soviets knew nothing about it, so they had to stick with a totalitarian dictatorial regime. No, it was the same technology. It's people made different decisions what to do with it. It's the same today. You compare today Russia with Sweden, they have access to exactly the same technology. Why does society look different? Because people made different decisions. Well, that's the, the first thing people should realize. It's really up to us. It's not the technology that tells us what to do with it. Surveillance technology is a good example. Surveillance technology can be used for the government to monitor citizens, but the technology can also be used in the opposite way for the citizens to monitor the government. For instance, to fight corruption. If they want to monitor us so much, why can't we monitor them? Like see what the officials are doing and deciding with our tax money. Why did, they, why did they give this contract of a billion rubles to, the, to uh, the minister's nephew and not to some other companies that gave a better bid? Now, with surveillance technology, you can survey the minister. You can survey the government to make it more transparent and prevent this. Yeah, the only problem is that technology itself is in the hand of that government. <laughs> exactly, but the first thing is to people to liberate themselves from thinking that this is inevitable. No, you have options. And then you need to put pressure. It can be political pressure of the citizens on the government. It can also be the way that, you know, you uh, develop technology. If you are a computer engineer, then work on an AI system to monitor government corruption instead of working on an AI system to monitor individual citizens and, and, and their political opinions. As an engineer or as a technician, you have some power over the technology that you are developing. In, and of course, not everybody is an engineer, but everybody has some limited power, of course, over uh, if you're a teacher, you have some power over the way you treat people and in, in, in what you teach pupils in class. Um, if, if you're a doctor, you have similar power in your clinic or over the patients, over the nurses, what kind of behaviors you, you allow there, what do you do with the information you gather on people? And right. maybe also the most important thing to remember is that for individuals, as long as you remain an isolated individual, it's extremely difficult to change things in society. Cooperation is the key to human power, to human success. 50 people who cooperate as part of an organization are far more powerful 
than 500 individuals, isolated individuals, each trying to do their own thing. Uh, we saw it, for instance, in the LGB2 movement also, that as long as gays and lesbians and transgenders, they are isolated individuals in the closet, not organized, not knowing anybody else in their situation, there was almost nothing they can do. But when even small numbers of individuals had the courage and ability to start forming organizations, they became suddenly far more powerful and catalyst for change. So, you know, there are many important causes in the world, environment, democracy, tolerance. You can't fight all the battles by yourself. But choose one which you think is important and that you can contribute to. Right. And join an organization which is focused on that struggle. You can't do it by yourself. The first really important step is to join an organization or to start an organization if there is no organization. Again, it doesn't need to be a million people. Do you personally participate in some kind of those organizations or initiatives? My husband and me, we, we take part in, in several organizations and, and initiatives in, in different uh, sections. I don't want to recommend a particular one. Uh, many of them are relevant more to, 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 to Israel. And again, I don't want to give the impression that this is what everybody has to do. Yeah. I mean, different people can contribute it in different ways. Uh, so, you know, you, you look at yourself, what are your capabilities, what is important to you, what is your passion? and try to make a difference there. Yeah, you I can't do everything alone. The organization, the particular organization, but in general, what uh, of the uh, problems did you choose to work on uh, as mm -hmm. a, an activist? Well, we work mainly in the field you know, of ideas, of disseminating ideas. Um, and so, you know, it's, 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 it's education, it's journalism, and it's spreading ideas in the world, either by writing books or by giving interviews like this. Yeah. Um, you can't change the world just by talking. That's but true. a lot of things, you know, begin with a seed. The seed is an idea. You plant the seed in a lot of minds. In many places, nothing will happen, but in a few minds, the seed will sprout and something good may, may come out of it. And this is exactly why I appreciate a lot that you spend this hour with me. And th this is really important, not just for me, but for the like, whole Russian society, I'm pretty sure. Mm -hmm. Thank you so very much for that. Thank you for inviting me and thank you for everybody who is watching and listening. Thanks. Bye-bye.